good morning, good morning. So now that the doctors have finished playing, um, we will get started. We were, as usual, you know, it will fill up as the day goes along. Um, welcome to day two of the Masters of Medicine Conference. I hope day one was everything you expected it to be and hopefully more. And for those of you who had a late night, I hope your late night was everything you expected it to be and more, exceedingly abundantly, more than you could ask. Um, so we are very, very, very thrilled to have had you all here. And for those of you who are joining us locally, we're so glad that you uh, came out on your Sunday morning. This is our second contiguous uh, conference. We've had three now, um, two in association with the uh, Association of Black Cardiologists and um, once with Vanderbilt University. So we are very interested in creating linkages to help bring a fund of inf information and knowledge home for our citizens and to also share with those of you who are international what we do here and how medicines practiced here and how it can impact your practices as well. So I hope that exchange, that dialogue um, is fruitful and worthwhile and I hope that it's actually yielding the fruit that we expect. So several things arose just yesterday. It struck me and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna say it. Several people came up yesterday, even one of the um, speakers and spontaneously said, oh, you know, and then I got sick, and then I came to the Heart Institute, and when I needed this particular test, you all sent me to such and such, and that doctor such and such was sitting right here in the audience because he'd, been, he'd come to be a speaker. And it struck me how interconnected the world can be and how much value we can receive just from knowing each other and also seeking common ground and mutual commonalities. So just knowing someone was able to help advance the healthcare of one of our uh, citizens. And so we, we are really grateful for this conference and for the friendship of, of all, our, um, all our guests. Um, as we went along, several of the speakers made mention of the collaborative between UPenn and the Heart Institute in the area of heart failure and how that also has already yielded fruit um, for our patients. And later in the day, Dr. Miller was talking about amyloid and I thought, hmm, we have a collaboration with Yale in the area of amyloid and there's a large multicenter trial and HIC happens to be one of those sites. So when you think that small moves you make are not impacting others, just keep going in the direction of good and eventually it will work out, not just for yourself, but really if your aim is to help other people, it, it always happens, it always happens. If you just keep moving in the direction of good, moving in the direction of excellence. So without further ado, I want to get the program started because there's more excellence to come. We have a ways to go, all of us in this room, to keep our practices sharp and to keep that high standards um, to which we aspire. And so I'd like to ask Dr. Maddy to come to the stage. He is actually taking over for me today as the runner. <laughs> so um, he's going to keep the program on pace and on target, and we thank you all. Same things apply, timers, bathrooms, all the housekeeping, coffee on the right, food will be on the back. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we're here again today and um, uh, looking forward to having another exciting uh, conference. Um, my remit today is to introduce uh, our keynote speaker uh, for today, um, a 
who happens to be a very dear friend of mine, and I'm delighted that uh, he was able to join us this time. Uh, last year, he was headed here, but some unfortunate events prevented him from coming, but he's here today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mark E. Anderson, MD, PhD. Uh, in August 2014, Dr. Mark Anderson became the William Osler Professor of Medicine and Director of the Department of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And in November 2014, he was named the Physician in Chief of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Anderson is an elected member of the American Society of Clinical Investigation the National Academy of Medicine, the Association of American Physicians, the American Clinical and Climatological Association, and the Foundation Ledoc Scientific Advisory Committee. All these memberships are in recognition of his stellar accomplishments as a physician scientist and a leader in the discovery of medical knowledge. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Anderson to the stage. He is going to give the keynote lecture for today, and I'm sure it will be a very exciting uh, lecture. Mark. Good morning, and uh, it's great to be here. I want to particularly thank uh, Ernest and Dania for um, inviting us, and and really, and to say how impressed and pleased I am that uh, through lots of hard work and collaboration, the HIC has been built. Uh, this is not um, this is a it's a marathon, not a sprint. And how you're really bringing uh, much better care for cardiovascular diseases. Uh, to the country of Jamaica. So um, I'm going to tell you a kind of different, little bit of a different story than what you've heard so far. And it's really one that uh, builds on lots of research from our group, but also the group of others. It's going to get, um, it's going to both look at a big picture, I think, and, and also it's going to take us very briefly into the, the weeds on a molecular level. And really it's to ask the question about, you know, why do we have cardiovascular disease? Why does why do we have common adult diseases related in particular to oxidant stress? And could it be that, um, that, that key advantages in the way we use oxidant stress for us uh, as vertebrates uh, uh, that we've evolved have also turned to be a kind of poison pill that um, leaves us susceptible to these adult diseases that um, are beyond the reach of, of evolution? As I look around the room, um, I know evolution no longer cares about me. There's some young people back there that evolution still cares about, but really evolution's business is, is front-loaded. And so I'm going to talk about this, and I, I appreciate your, um, your presence and attention. So now I'm going to see if I can... If I press this little arrow, does it go forward? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start with two really simple cases. So, so the first is a case of, of some, of some uh, mild asthma. This is a, these are both cases that I saw when I was at the University of Iowa. But this is a middle-aged uh, woman who had a history of childhood asthma. And uh, she had asthma when she was young. It kind of went away. This happens. And then in her early 30s, she had recurrent symptoms. These are uh, chest tightness, uh, not a, a non-productive cough, some wheezing. Um, and occasionally she'd have nocturnal respiratory distress. And importantly, it wasn't, it wasn't related, to, it wasn't made better by common uh, first-line inhaled medications. Her physical exam was really just consistent with, with, with inflammation, of course, that we heard about uh, yesterday. And her spirometry wasn't uh, responsive to, uh, to uh, uh, beta agonists and her x-ray just showed some mild hyperinflation. So this is a case of mild, but still symptomatically meaningful asthma. The second case is, is a heart case. So this is a 40-year-old uh, man with a, 
history of epigastric discomfort, that, that he had these symptoms for about 45 minutes. Um, he would had, had this symptom once before, a few days before when he was mowing his lawn, and uh, they went away spontaneously. His past medical history is notable for type 1 diabetes, which he's had since age 10, um, some hypertension in the last uh, five years, and he's on kind of usual uh, and appropriate medications. So when he presents to the emergency department, his, he's, uh, he's somewhat hypertensive, he's, he's tachypnic, um, but he doesn't have a sign of congestion, he doesn't have an S3, um, and, and the labs are sent, uh, strangely, the only one that really that, that comes back that's, that's abnormal at this point is, is hemoglobin A1C, which is, is elevated. And then, the, of course, the most common test still in most hospitals is this one. And, and so it's not a diagnostic dilemma. This person is having a big inferior myocardial infarction, probably a posterior myocardial infarction. And, and he, gets, he gets to the cath lab right away. You'd be pleased to hear this in 15 minutes. And, and so he has this, this, uh, he has this tight right, uh, this right occlusion. It gets, it gets treated right away. So the question is not what to do. Everything that was done was what needed to be done. The question is, what is the prognosis of this patient? Because people that have diabetes and have myocardial infarction have a, a, a mortality that's, that's approximately double people that don't have diabetes. And although there are lots of ideas, it's not so simple because that difference persists even when you factor out you know, bread and butter clinical variables like LV function and uh, the extent of epicardial coronary disease. So this is called a diabetic paradox. So the question is really things like this, these common diseases, asthma, diabetes, myocardial infarction, could they have, could there be larger, you know, pathways or forces that help to explain um, how they come together. We heard a really uh, lovely lecture yesterday about how, um, how cardiac diseases and cancer may converge because of the way they share uh, uh, assembled mutations within hemopoietic cells. So this is a kind of similar question. So I'm going to give a heuristic or just present a heuristic um, concept of, uh, of how disease initiating events, these could be environmental, they could be genetic susceptibility, they could be things that converge, uh, but many of them increase in, are, are associated with an increase in ROS or reactive oxygen species or oxygen stress. And, and, and these oxygen stress pathways somehow contribute to disease perpetuation, maybe even initiation. This is a common idea in many of the, in most of the adult diseases we study in internal medicine. And I want to just focus here on this kind of, this part of the, of the model. Now, if you look at diseases that have some kind of theory or hypothesis or concept of excessive oxidant stress, it's really harder to name ones that don't than ones that do, and I've just listed a few ones that are impactful enough that they have public health level meaning. But when we get down to, well, what do we do? If that's such a shared and important concept, we should be able to, to target that. So I've given you a few of the, of the pieces of our armamentarium. And the, and the short answer, and at least to my uh, understanding currently, there are no randomized controlled studies showing a benefit for antioxidant therapies, mostly general therapies. Um, and so I think in broad strokes, it's fair to say that they don't work. And it could be because these concepts, these, these theories are, are wrong. It may also be that we just don't understand in a concise and focused enough way on how to manipulate those pathways. It's also really complicated because uh, oxidant stress is core to our, um, our, our metabolism. Oxidative phosphorylation is sort of a, 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 a way that we generate most of our ATP. Certainly that's uh, really important for, for the heart. And, and it's good, particularly in, uh, in exercise. This is a paper that's been cited thousands of times. And it makes the case that, that oxidant stress uh, in, in exercise that's transient produces all kinds of downstream benefits in terms of gene transcription, in terms of metabolism, and, and ultimately in terms of disease, uh, reduced disease risk. So, so it's complicated. 
And so maybe this kind of model is, is, is just, of course it's too simple, but maybe it's just too one-sided. And so perhaps a model that looks something like this, that increased ROS, at least under some circumstances, does contribute to disease. I think that, that's, that, that there's a lot of evidence to make that, uh, to support that idea. But, but increased ROS can also, in, in, in the proper dosing and context, be important for health perpetuating mechanisms. And this is, uh, ties into this concept called hormesis, which is that essentially that the dose response characteristic is complicated. And, and here what you see is that there is a, um, that, that, at the, that at the very low dose, if you take away, in this case, all oxidant stress, that's, that's probably bad. And it may not confer certain benefits, say, of, of exercise or metabolism that there's a sweet spot of benefits, sort of like Goldilocks and the three bears, it's just right. And then as you extend the dose or the chronicity of the signal, it becomes bad again. So it's not that something is good or bad, it's both good and bad, and it's, it's, it's gotta be measured and timed in a correct way. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask you to just sort of, this is the only slide where I think you really have to work. But um, this is a cartoon of an enzyme that we have studied for, I don't know, my childhood is for over 20 years. Its full name is the multifunctional calcium and calmodulin dependent protein kinase 2. That's too hard, so we say chem kinase 2 or chem K2. And it's an enzyme that's present in, there's a ton of it in your heart, in your skeletal muscle, in your brain, and in your immune cells. And it is a, it, it, it's a kinase. So remember, kinase is just an enzyme that lowers the free energy so it's easy to put a phosphate from ATP onto, in this case, a serine or threonine in a, in a kind of according to an address. And this is a fundamental way in biology of how we change um, behaviors really quickly without having to change gene transcription, for example. And it's really important in the heart for every single heartbeat, for heart rate acceleration, um, and, and for all kinds of things. So kinases are 2% of the genome. It's, it's a really big part of, of what we need to be alive. Um, and I'm just gonna focus a little bit on the far left where it says inactive. Like many kinases, it's not active at baseline. In fact, it has a little piece, that, that green kind of uh, line that is blocking it. It's an auto-inhibitory sequence, so it's not turned on all the time. In the case of this kinase, the way it gets activated initially is when calcium rises in the cell. And we, we heard a little bit about a remarkable but still early device for stimulating the heart um, in between beats when, during the refractory period that was, was thought to make the heart beat harder and do better because of the way it mobilizes calcium in the cell. So calcium is rising and falling in every heart muscle cell with every contraction. And when it does, it, the calcium is a, is a very conserved second messenger. It's one thing that causes myofilament proteins to engage. That's how your heart contracts and then relax when it unbinds. But it also binds to other cal calcium sensing proteins, in this case, calmodulin. Calmodulin is figured here in this, in this story as a kind of little purple dumbbell-shaped device. And when calmodulin binds to calcium, it opens up and it embraces chem kinase at that little green string. And when it does that, it pulls the inhibitory region away and the kinase becomes active. And so when calcium rises, the kinase becomes active, and when it falls, it becomes inactive, and like that, up and down, on and off. But it turns out that it's slightly more complicated, and I want you to just focus on this far right. And that, that's because if, if that green area of that auto-inhibitory area is modified, and we found that it could be modified by oxidant stress, it no longer can be effective at inhibiting the enzyme. And, in, and, and another area is this, is that blue T or threonine at 287. If that is phosphorylated by a neighboring kinase, it also can't shut off the kinase. So the kinase becomes constitutively active. And we think that that's a conserved mechanism. It probably does good things, but we and others have shown that chem kinase that's modified by oxidation or by autophosphorylation, can, it's much more likely to contribute to various kinds of heart disease. Now, this is work that is collaborative, and Dr. Madhu is one of the, is one of the authors, and when we were at, at Vanderbilt, 
And this was really early work that I, I, I'm presenting really because um, at that time uh, it was emerging in the, in the field that chemokinase is a signal that is increased in its expression and increased in its activity in failing human hearts of all kinds of flavors, hypertrophic, idiopathic, bread and butter, post-myocardial infarction, and, the, and, and also mirrored in lots of animal models. But because the field still does not have uh, clinically usable chemokinase inhibitor drugs, um, a real question at that time was, a lot of things go up or down, but does that mean that it contributes in some way to the actual disease? Is chemokinase good or bad? And so we took advantage of a strategy of, because there are four chemokinase genes, it's complicated to do knockouts in this way. We, we took a peptide inhibitor that looks kind of like that, that green string, that auto-inhibitory region, and we fused it to um, green fluorescent protein. This is a protein that glows green. It's, it was originally identified in jellyfish. It's been tinkered with a little bit. And so we could express it using a promoter that only expressed this inhibitor in heart muscle cells. And it turned the hearts green. And the one that says AC3I, I is for inhibitor. Those hearts have inhibited chemokinase in all the heart cells. And those mice, it turns out, do just fine. And then C is for control. We took one of those peptides and tinkered with it just a bit so it didn't have any activity. It was just a control for the fact that we were expressing of abnormal protein in a heart muscle cell. And those, those hearts also look fine at baseline. And what you can see uh, in the middle panel is, well, in the top panel, is we, we've sent these mice all around the world, and they have been shown to be disease resistant to all kinds of, of heart disease. Um, and here's an example of, of an early thing we did, which was, was, was subject these mice to a surgical myocardial infarction. So, one thing you can see is that mice are really tough compared to people because people wouldn't survive that kind of myocardial infarction. This is almost 50% of the circumference of their left ventricle. And what you can see is that already that um, the AC, both of them have heart attacks. Both of them have this scar and, and because this was a permanent ligation. But you can see that the AC3I, the chemokinase inhibited heart, doesn't dilate nearly as much as the control heart. And that's clinically important because that kind of post-myocardial infarction LV dilation portends all kinds of bad things, sudden death, more hospitalization, um, more heart failure. And you could see in the, in the panel labeled genetic inhibition, if we start at the baseline before they have this surgery, all of them have a similar fractional shortening. But the black squares in the middle, um, those are those do better over the three weeks after the myocardial infarction than the control or the wild type. And although there's not a chemokinase inhibitor drugs, there are some tool compounds. And when we infused a, a tool inhibitor at a low or high dose in a wild type mouse, that also improved its function after, after myocardial infarction surgery compared to a, a control inactive compound. So these kind of data uh, convinced us and I think convinced the field that chemokinase uh, was, an, was an important player in the kind of post-myocardial infarction uh, adverse remodeling that happens after, after myocardial infarction. So this is just summarizing uh, a number of papers that came from our laboratory looking at how that might work. And we heard a lot about some of the cornerstone heart failure medicines that work by as neurohumoral antagonists. And what this slide is intended to make the point is that chemokinase is activated downstream to all of those signaling pathways, and it contributes in disease models to, um, to heart disease from, from catecholamine signaling to renin angiotensin and aldosterone signaling. But it does it by slightly different mechanisms, and it turns out they all involve post-translational modifications to that auto-inhibitory region, that green region I showed you on the cartoon. But catecholamines, so beta, beta adrenergic signaling components, work because they, they phosphorylate that threonine. But renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone work because they oxidize that pair of methionines we'd identified um, uh, re, uh, a few years later. So, so chemkinase seems to be a nodal point that is captured by neurohumoral signals and has the potential to contribute to disease. It's just 
it's, it's listening to those upstream signals through these different ways. And one of the ways is because it's activated by oxidant stress. So, um, so this is to summarize, uh, this, this cuts the talk a, a lot shorter. This is work by us, by others. Um, and I, I, I had to cut out some, some slides about diabetes and asthma just to make the talk fit in the time. But, and they're not necessarily included there. I guess asthma is, but not diabetes. But these are some of the conditions where oxidized chemokinase has been implicated as a, as a signal that connects pathological levels of oxidant stress to disease diseases. Um, and, and so, as you can see, these are um, important, these represent some important diseases, some of them with inflammatory components, um, almost all of them diseases that are a problem in, in adults. So, um, a, a really smart uh, scientist in my lab, uh, Xinchuan Wang, um, was looking at, at the kinase, and you can, this is a really ancient kinase. It's present in some of the earliest organisms. And he did a, what's called a phylogenetic tree. And you're not expected to, to read the little dots, but just note that um, there's a picture of a blue annelid worm. That worm doesn't have a, doesn't have a spine or vertebrate. And then there's a woman in a yellow dress where her spine is prominently figured. And, and what you can see is that, although this is a lineup of that inhibit, of the, of the sequence, the amino acid sequence of that, that green string, that auto-inhibitory region. And what it says is that the modification sites are all ancient except for these oxidation sites. These oxidation sites occur for the first time in vertebrates, and then they're sustained throughout all evolution. So this is kind of surprising because, um, because at least to us, we've just shown that it's, it's bad, that it, it connects oxidant stress to disease. And, and we work with, you can't see his name necessarily, but the, the, the guy below, Dr. Wang, is, is Gabe Bever. And it turns out at Hopkins, the people who teach anatomy to medical students, that, that's their day job, but, they're, but what they all are evolutionary biologists. And he's in my, the, the, the office with my administrative, uh, in the building with my administrative office. So I just, I, I, I looked him up and he had these great papers. So we met and I said, we are kind of looking at this and, and I'm not an evolutionary biologist. Do you think this is very compelling? And he was instantly compelled. He said, this is very unusual that you would make the switch. There must be some advantage in, in these, in the ability of chemokinase to be activated by oxidation. And because it's in vertebrates, and this is just another way of looking at this, that that some of these sites, the threonine, or another site that a post, former postdoc of mine uh, identified as a sugar-modified site, are really old. The, the enzyme is a billion years old. But about 500 million years ago, these methionines happened with, with vertebrates. The first vertebrate is the hagfish. You may remember this from biology. And, um, and so uh, we did a couple of things. So one thing, we, we, we used this remarkable technology called CRISPR, and, and we turned to the fly, the mosquito. This is a big problem all around the world, even in, particularly in, in uh, Jamaica. And, and, and this, the, the fly, or dros the fruit fly, or Drosophila, um, has just one chemokinase gene. And it doesn't have methionines because it's not a vertebrate. So we use CRISPR to, to humanize or vertebratize uh, the fly chemokinase. And then we subjected it, we asked a really simple question. If we challenged it with ROS, uh, w could, we, could we measure anything that was different? Um, and, and we used Paraquat. Paraquat is an herbicide that is used to, um, in all kinds of situations. But the way it works, the way it kills things is it generates reactive oxygen species. And so we, in a dose-dependent way, we subjected these, um, these flies to paraquat. And what you could see, and I think this is really remarkable, is the MM flies. Those are the ones that we've knocked in these methionines. Otherwise, the kinase is, is the same. That they die in, in excess compared to the wild type with paraquat. So death is a pretty, I mean, it's a very hard endpoint, but it's also complicated. ROS could adduct to DNA, it could, it could change cell membranes, but just by, just by making chemokinase so it could be activated by ROS was enough to get a mortality signal in this, in this, um, in this uh, challenge. But that doesn't really tell us. That says 
that this really does confer raw sensing and it might be important. And even in an invertebrate, uh, they're primed to have um, downstream consequences of a, of a oxidatively activated chemokinase. But why do vertebrates have this? It can't be just so that they're susceptible to adult diseases. And um, Dr. Bever, the evolutionary biologist, said, well, lots of things happen in vertebrates. But one is that skeletal muscle biology becomes really important. And, and that's because fight and flight uh, physiology for, for prey and predation become really important. It's really important to scramble, to be able to get to someplace quickly, to be able to get away from someplace quickly. And so we created a model where the chemokinase isoform that's most represented in skeletal muscle um, was made insensitive to ROS. So we took the methionines, which are what, happen, what we all have, and switched, switched them out so the skeletal muscle chemokinase looked like fly chemokinase. It couldn't be activated by ROS. And the, and the short answer to this is, and then we ran these mice, we first trained them to get used to a treadmill, and then we ran them to exhaustion. And if you took away the, this, these MMs, the mice couldn't run as far, and they couldn't run as fast. So that's consistent with the idea that there is some fight or flight advantage to, for evolution to make chemokinase activated by oxidation. Now, it turns out that, that exercise is also a real, exercise, you know, your, how good you are at exercise is complicated. It can be linked to motivation and to metabolism and to blood flow. And so I don't have time to show you, but we, we, we think we, ruled out all those possibilities. And, um, and we collaborated with some people at the University of, of, of Maryland who are exercise physiologists. And they, one of the things they did was they put this mouse on a machine that looks kind of like what some of you may have at the gym. It, it's a kind of a legs torquing, straightening exercise. And these mice were sedated and they were stimulated by the femoral nerve, but what you can see in the in the picture with the red and the gray, is that the, that if you if you stimulate the nerve, you would get this torquing. The, the the legs would straighten out, but it would fatigue, and that that's expected. But the fatigue was much faster in the mice that had this knock-in mutation, where chemokinase could no longer sense oxidant stress. You can see that in the gray, whereas the red, the wild type, has has greater torquing strength. And the summary data are on the right. So this said uh, that, that probably oxidized chemokinase makes you exercise better and it makes your skeletal muscles perform better. There's still some caveats about that and it doesn't say really how, but as we, we discussed really early that calcium is a really important second messenger in muscle and one of the things that chemokinase does is it mobilizes intracellular calcium. And so, um, uh, Dr. Schneider has uh, e an in vitro uh, assay of, of fatigue. And, and here, skeletal muscle fibers are stimulated, and we can measure calcium uh, it rise and fall inside the cell. That's what this tracing is in the, on the left before fatigue. You can see superimposed are the wild type, and then these knock in mice that don't have oxygen stress. And there's a, they're, they're pretty similar, although the Calcium peaks aren't quite as high in these knock-in mice. But after fatigue, you see a really expanded difference, that the wild-type mice sustain their intracellular calcium, which is necessary to ha for muscle contraction, whereas these knock-in mice uh, have much lower transients, which is, could, could well be the reason that they fatigue so much more readily. Now, I, I showed you this picture of a paper early on about why oxidant stress might be good because in exercise it does a lot of reprogramming of the genome and in fact a lot is known about people that have a single bout of ex sedentary people that have a single bout of exercise their muscles have a stereotype pattern of gene reprogramming that involves inflammation it involves um, antioxidant uh, proteins and it involves metabolism and this is a way using a, a, a kind of a, a study called RNA-seq where we can essentially sample all of the transcriptional changes in skeletal muscle. And what we did was we looked at wild-type mice and regular mice and, and, and what the genome looked like in their skeletal muscles when they're resting. And that's what this parentheses that said said. And this is a kind of 
analysis that looks at how all of the genes together cohere, so the details aren't important. But the key is that at, at rest, it, these sedentary mice look pretty similar, whether they have skeletal muscle that has oxidizable chem kinase or not. But once they exercise, a single bout of non-exhaustive exercise, because remember, the ones that have the knock-in mutation, they can't run as far as fast. So we kind of had a, a sub-maximal exercise so they could all run the same amount. And now you see this real splay between the MM, that's the wild type in exercise, and the VV, this is the knock-in in mouse. So we went back to these flies we made that had the knock-in mutation. So the, these flies have, the, have a chem kinase that can be oxidized. And we found something similar, that when we looked at those same genes that changed with exercise in mice due to oxidized chem kinase, that at, at rest, these flies were very similar. But if you look at the, at the columns on the, on the right, that after paraquat, this oxidant signal, which is in this case a, a, a simplified version of exercise, that there, there starts to be a dispersion, that, that oxidized chem kinase is clearly connecting oxidant stress to gene transcription. So if that were true, maybe just if, if we went back in evolution and we added this ability of chem kinase to sense oxidant stress, you know, one possibility is that it could um, create a kind of super fly. Does it make a fly so it can exercise? And I'm, I'm going to tell you, I don't, I don't have a way of controlling this, so I think it's okay. But what I was going to show you is that if you, if flies are put into a little straw and they're kind of tapped like this, they all fall to the bottom, but they, they're, they're ambitious and they, they try and climb up vertically. And that the flies that, that have this oxidant stressing, chem, sensing chem kinase actually crawl up faster than the wild flies. And the summary data are shown here. Now, flies don't have hearts, but they have um, something that is very heart-like. And in fact, most of the key genes that were identified for heart formation were identified in flies because they can be knocked out and a fly can live without its heart. It pumps endolin. But so it's a heart tube. And when we looked at, we used echo to look at the heart tube function. And what you can see is that these flies that had oxidant sensing chem kinase have better shortening velocity, better fractional shortening, and better relaxation. So, so they are kind of super flies. <coughs> so I just have two more slides. And so we asked if, 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 if making chem kinase so it can sense oxidation makes the flies super, uh, does it also confer a susceptibility to disease like it apparently does for vertebrates? And to, Ask that question, we turn back to this paraquat uh, at, at a much lower dose. And I, unfortunately, I don't know how to do, these are echo tests that show that at baseline, you can watch these tubes contracting. And that it, in the wild type fly, where chem kinase can't sense oxidant stress, paraquat really doesn't screw it up. But in the fly with the knock in mutation, so these flies have chem kinase that sense oxidant stress, what we see, and you can see that in the summary data, is that they get a lot of arrhythmias and, and dysfunction. So it's very similar to what we see in people or what we see, what we see in, in vertebrates, that it supercharges, but the downside is it sets you up for disease susceptibility. So I think that, that, um, that chem kinase and its ability to be oxidized can teach us a lot about ideas that, um, that help us to understand how fundamental signals like oxidant stress are good and bad, and how um, providing that sensing capability would have been evolutionarily advantageous, and simultaneously, especially in, in, in older adults, where, which is, and age is the, is the major risk factor for cardiovascular disease, that it, it's bad. So, we think that there is, this is what's called an evolutionary trade-off, that the, that the activation of chem kinase by oxidant signaling um, enhances core things that would be very valuable for improved survival. And one of them appears to be fight or flight physiology. But it comes as a trade-off or another side of the coin, which is that later in life, after, beyond the reach of evolution, it, it, it appears to set us up to ROS-related diseases of, of adulthood. 
So it has this dual nature of improved performance but enhanced disease susceptibility. I just want to say that um, this work represents a, a, a real romp and lots of people have contributed to it. I don't have time to name them all here, but I wanted to represent them in this list. So thank you. Wow. So Dr. Madhu was supposed to be doing this part, right? But wow. <laughs> I had to take it. Do you know how smart you have to be to make a complex bench lab area understandable to an audience. Wow, that was really good, really good. I'm sure people have a lot of questions, and so we, you have questions and Mark has answers. Yeah, that was great and, and very, very interesting uh, findings. So I have two questions. The first question I have is, what's the effect of uh, exercise, I mean, exercise training on the CAM kinase and its uh, oxidative form? And my second question is, is there a difference in uh, male and female uh, individuals? That is a great question. So uh, the exercise appears to, so, you know, you might think that exercise, exercise mobilizes calcium in the cell, and chemokinase is in the muscle cells for the purposes of this discussion, and, it, um, and there's oxidant stress. Uh, so you might think chemokinase would be activated by either of those equally, but it turns out because what we see with these knock-in models where chemokinase is completely normal, it just can't be activated through the oxidative pathway, is that it doesn't really get activated. I didn't have time to show you this, but we developed some uh, reporter probes that where, where um, a, a known chemokinase target, in this case it's an HDAC, um, is, is, is decorated with a signal that wants to pull it out of the nucleus and another signal that wants to pull it into the nucleus. And when chemokinase phosphorylates it, 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 it makes the, it makes the signal that pulls it out of the nucleus better, and it makes the signal that pulls it into the nucleus worse. So there's this tug of war as kind of balance, and after phosphorylation, chemokinase leaves the nucleus and goes into the cytoplasm, and it's linked to the same kind of a fluorescent reporter so we can measure that in a real cell. And what we see is that, um, that its activation in muscle is almost entirely related to that oxidant signal. So we think it gets activated through oxidant signaling. We do see differences in males and females, and um, I, you know, I feel both both guilty and practical because we often have not focused on that just because it doubles the expense of ever, you know, of any of any treatment. But you know, I would love to. And it's it's remarkable how how gender has a huge effect on things that really surprised me when I was young, just biophysical things about how ion channels work and calcium signaling works. And, and I, there's some models that have a gender dependence and, 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 and of course many that don't appear to at least in our hands, but it hasn't been our focus. So I apologize for that, because I feel, you know, I, they want you to do that and you have to, you have to write more and more, but they're not, it turns out they're not providing you more money to do it. Excellent, okay. excellent talk. Uh, but I was sitting here thinking, how do we take the bench to the bedside? And I'm wondering if you, in the future, you could see the utility in patients with myasthenia gravis. Yeah, so uh, let, me, let me sort of dissect that into two things. I think that, that the field needs a, a, a chemokinase inhibitor drug. I haven't really painted all the complexity for you, but, but chemokinase, there's four. We and mice uh, have four different chemokinase genes on four different chromosomes. This is presumably part of a gene duplication uh, event that most evolutionary biologists believes, believed happened around vertebrate uh, biology. The genes all encode very similar proteins. They all seem to do the same thing. They all 
in fact, they gather together, I didn't talk about this, but 12 of these single um, proteins come together to form the holoenzyme, and, they, and that's mixed. It's a, it, 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 but they're distributed differently in cells, so there's one flavor that's predominant in heart, and there's one flavor that's predominant in brain, and one flavor that's predominant, as I alluded to, in skeletal muscle. So we, the one worry is that the inhibitor might not just you know, target the heart, but it would also get into the brain where we might not want that. Chemkinase, for example, is implicated in learning and memory. So this has been, we have had a, I, I had a biotech for a decade with um, my collaborator, Howard Schulman, who ran the neuroscience program at Stanford, and he, he discovered chemkinase when he was a, a postdoc working in an eminent lab. And, and it's, there are other companies trying to do this. It's been a, it's been a struggle. I think it will work because it's such a highly validated target, though. In terms of myasthenia gravis, tell me what, I, I don't exactly understand what you're thinking here. Right, right. So I think there, though, the fatigue is more related to the acetylcholine receptor and the antibodies to that receptor than it is to being able to mobilize calcium downstream in the skeletal muscles. So it's an interesting idea. I, I, I think, I don't know what would happen. I, I think you, I think somebody with myasthenia, you would not want to give them a chemkinase inhibitor. That would be my feeling. It would be just the opposite. Yes. In uh, thinking about your uh, initial graph that suggested that a certain amount of oxidative stress is good and too much is not so good. And maybe I'm thinking of it too simplistically. I'm sure there are good oxidative stresses and not so good oxidative stresses. But that might suggest that if you exercise, it's good, but if you do too much exercise, it's bad. And I don't, I, my knowledge of the field suggests that uh, the data indicate that the more exercise, the better, and you can't overdo it. Um, but I'm so I'm wondering your thoughts on that, given your model here. Well, I think there's a lot, um, you know, there's an emerging uh, concept. I think with with reasonable data that it's really the dosing, like having intermittent, uh, even high amounts of oxidative stress, as occur, for example, in exercise, is beneficial, probably for the reprogramming and the fact that it. I mean, kind of like. Uh, yeah, so, beca because it, maybe it creates more antioxidant capacity, it changes metabolism in a favorable way. In terms of, can you have too much of a good thing? So I, you know, I, I've come to believe probably you can. There are a little bit of data that you you maximize the benefits of exercise at relatively modest amounts of exercise, and the people that do really extreme, like hundred mile runs and they get more atrial fibrillation, for example. There's been a couple bigger papers about that. So I, 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 I hesitate to say that's bec you know that those two things are anything more than a correlation. But I, I mean, I think almost certainly you can do too much. I, you know, probably most of us in the room are not at risk for that. But I don't. You know, I, don't. I have. Uh, oops. I have uh, somewhat of, uh, I guess, a philosophical question. Um, which is um, you showed a long list of conditions in which uh, this pathway could be uh, could play a role, and the question always is who gets what and why, and that often is very difficult. And um, I had the unique opportunity to serve as chair of a study panel that was looking at heart, sleep, and cancer, and so I was interested to hear the commonalities that existed in these things, and yet for an individual person, they may get multiple conditions, but they're exposed to the same uh, risk factor, and they may get completely different diseases, cardiovascular versus lung cancer or something else. Just wondered if you could just reflect on that a little bit and see how this body of work might help us understand those yeah, different pathways. Uh, yeah, that's a really, um profound question, actually, and I think, uh, you know, it is part of what is supposed to be rooted out and balanced and reckoned in the concept of personalized medicine. 
Um, I think, my, so in, in full disclosure, I'm a lumper, you know, as opposed to a splitter. So I, and partly just because of Occam's razor and I can't remember all the things I'd have to remember if I was a splitter, that's why I didn't go into IT. Uh, that that um, I believe that their core uh, signaling pathways that are conserved and repurposed in different kinds of cells that you know create different readouts, but that they are the sort of central machinery for lots of health and disease. And but I, but I would be misleading you to or, or, or myself to say I really understand them at such a deep level that I can predict why one would trigger this disease manifestation earlier than another. And we see this all the time in the natural history of diseases you know, that, that, that we know in general, but in one particular patient, this thing happens earlier than that thing, or, and, and so, I, I mean, I, I think you've, you've opened up a really important set of questions, and I don't have a good answer yet. I think understanding the central signaling will be, you know, components, will be an essential um, piece, of, essential knowledge base to actually be able to ask that. I don't think we'll be able to understand that until we do understand the central signal components that are necessary for the diseases, because we don't know how to unpack that stuff otherwise. And Dr. Anderson, that was a oh, very good talk. Oh, uh, just, Thank you. I see parallels, right, because uh, I spent a summer with a friend of mine, and rather than looking at PKD isoforms and the downstream effects from reactive oxygen species in terms of but he's looking at tyrosine phosphorylation of um, ERK1, ERK2 subfamily of MAT kinase and uh, tinkering with that and, and seeing how that could um, prevent um, apoptotic cell death, mediate, you know, me mediating the effects downstream of reactive oxygen species. But we are using small molecules and that was, it was quite an impressive result. It's just because of the cascading effect, you can very precisely inhibit something and um, change a whole series of reactions. So are you looking at um, PKD isoforms, or are, I just wondered? Well, we I haven't, see a lot of parallels. Yeah, we haven't thought about, uh, uh, we, we have thought about PKD. At one time I considered that, so PKD and chemkinase actually have very similar, I said that there was an address for serines and threonines, and those addresses, the sequence of amino acids that says phosphorylate this one and not that one, looks pretty similar for PKD and chemkinase. And, uh, and so I wondered uh, also because um, that, because of the way the holoenzyme works that in theory chemkinase could bind to PKD and maybe create the super enzyme. And I did have the person who is, uh, she's an assistant professor now and my lab manager. That was her first postdoctoral uh, you know, question and we couldn't get it to go anywhere. But what I would say about it is that it is remarkable what small molecules can do. And the cancer field has accepted this for a long time. They're inhibiting kinases all over the place and you know, often to, to therapeutic benefit. The cardiovascular, you know, it's harder, as you know, to, this has been a big year for cardiovascular drugs, but it, it's harder to develop a cardiovascular drug because people take them not just for a sporadic period, but for life. And because the drugs we have, although not adequate, have really changed the game. We saw this, we saw the death rate from myocardial infarction yesterday has dropped by 50%, you know, in our lifetime. It's, it's remarkable. So this, the, the energy barrier, what you have to achieve to get something approved and the amount of off-target effect or risk uh, pharma and, and, and investors are willing to accept or the FDA is willing to accept is much less. The value proposition is candidly much easier in cancer for developing these drugs. Thank you. I'll say wow one more time. This is a real wow uh, lecture. Uh, please give me, uh, help me give uh, Dr. Anderson another round of applause. 
you know, I said thank you. When I asked Mark to give the HIC Founders Lecture, um, I did so because uh, he has done magnificent work over many years. Uh, very innovative, very creative, and um, I think he is onto something that will further revolutionize the way we take care of cardiovascular patients. And I think everyone have seen what I've seen for 20 plus years. Thank you, Mark. Um, we'll move on uh, in the program to the next uh, session uh, will be devoted to interventional cardiology and cardiac surgery. Um, the moderator of this session is Dr. Ahmed Suleiman. Um, I'm gonna ask her. Ahmed is a uh, uh, term director of uh, cardiovascular interventions at the Heart Institute of the Caribbean. Ahmed, thanks. Hi, good morning all. It's very rich sessions. And finally, intervention. That's my specialty, so I'm interested a little bit in it. Um, we will uh, uh, go forward. Uh, next session will be uh, uh, the emerging interventional cardiology options. Uh, um, I'm glad to present uh, uh, Dr. Professor uh, Stephen Kies. He is the chairman of the Supervisory Board of American Heart of Poland, clinical professor of medicine and cardiology, University of Texas. So please. Thank you very much for, uh, for having me here, uh, Ernest. And obviously, uh, you gave me a, a very tricky uh, uh, schedule. Uh, speaking after uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Anderson is kind of uh, unnerving. And I feel like uh, coming from the molecular uh, level to the, you know, to the cave, uh, we will talk about the spokes where the oxidative uh, stress went real bad and something has to be done, and obviously has to be done uh, in the scarce resources. So uh, after working in Peter Morocco lab and uh, working some, some uh, uh, on the dogs and uh, then uh, uh, did a lot of work on uh, Mr. Nuzzo, MCP1 and, that, and other things, uh, I had to kind of switch and become a businessman and also uh, sort of start thinking about how to uh, create the 21st uh, century model of cardiovascular and vascular healthcare. So what you can see here, this is our San Antonio um, offices when we, see we have all the non-invasive uh, workup and stuff. And um, basically, uh, I will talk about uh, the regular plumbing uh, the last 12 years when uh, after traveling to the world, teaching in Japan, Europe, etc., uh, I frequently you had to do uh, complex procedures without any surgical backup. As you can see, um, uh, what we do in San Antonio, we do everything out on outpatient basis. We do uh, complex interventions, except the one big difference, and this is uh, one uh, same, same day in discharge. Uh, we also uh, see a lot of peripheral arterial disease and a lot of amputations, like I was surprised. This is also a problem in, in Jamaica. Uh, so San Antonio and Kingston have a lot in common uh, in this area. Uh, so we have the highest amputation rate in the United States. And uh, think for a moment how your life changes after you lose the limb. So uh, obviously uh, we do a lot of uh, various uh, uh, techniques, arthrectomies, uh, bundle angioplasty, stenting, etc. And then we also do uh, neurovascular interventions. I actually happen to be uh, a third guy in the world who did the carotid stenting. Julio Palmas was uh, assisting me at this time and our patient actually survived. That was, that was in the last century. But we'll do those uh, on selected patients also on outpatient basis and also uh, anything which has plumbing problem like uh, mesenteric uh, ischemia or uh, uh, renal artery stenosis in patients with CKD, et cetera, uh, we can do this as well. Uh, so the, the, the devil is in details. How, how can we discharge patients safely the same day? Because that cuts the costs and uh, in my opinion also increases the uh, safety of the patient. 
So first of all, uh, over 12 years ago, I switched to the direct thrombin inhibitor, uh, angiomax or, or bivalgoidin, so we don't have the issues uh, uh, with, uh, which are related to uh, HIT happen uh, is quite unpredictable at times. Then obviously, uh, my friend uh, from Holland, uh, Dr. Professor Kimney, a long time ago, uh, they've developed a radial axis. And this radial axis for coronary interventions now finally comes to the United States and becomes uh, uh, in our center, that's 99% of all our uh, uh, coronary interventions that obviously is very easy to uh, control bleeding if you put your finger on your wrist, uh, radial or ulnar, as opposed to trying to press your groin. Uh, so, and uh, you avoid also retroperitoneal uh, bleed, which is uh, at times uh, lethal. So, uh, then of course, smaller sheath, uh, make sure that the equipment which we have is of top quality, so we don't depend on some kind of bean counter in the VP institution who will uh, buy the cheapest stands possible. And then um, we have certain uh, uh, renal uh, patients who uh, we need ha have to renal uh, protection the protocols, uh, very close follow-up of the patients, uh, very personalized care. This is really you have one-on-one -on -one nursing or sometimes two nurses. Uh, so that makes the, all this uh, possible. Obviously, you have to have a state-of-the-art facility, okay? This is not a, your garage C-arm kind of stuff, but it has to be a, a, a very you know, good, uh, in my opinion, Philips is probably the best. And you have to, the people are most important. We have a nursing staff which is over 30 years gone by experience. This is not the travelers who come in and out. Everybody is certified, uh, cardiovascular uh, technicians who get access and stuff and to be very, uh, of a very high quality. Everybody's obviously licensed. And that's how our facility looks. This is the second facility when we do all the uh, interventions, cardiovascular and vascular. You can see our schedule there. Uh, the names are blacked out, but uh, that was the day when m most of the time was ca cardiac stuff, but sometimes it's all peripheral. And uh, these are our, this is uh, where, uh, why I'm here. Uh, one, once upon a time, <coughs> if you can see Dr. Uh, Madhu showed up uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Ozigo, and uh, they wanted to see what we have. Uh, on the right uh, upper corner, this is uh, uh, me presenting some complex stuff at TCT when I'm a faculty for the last 20 some years. Then uh, uh, this is my Japanese experience when I was going back and forth in, in Japan and, and we're doing this complex rotablation uh, without any surgical backups. You can see we're sweating quite a bit. And these are my fellows who come from Poland. Uh, every year I fund uh, one of them and then do clinical work. So um, basically uh, this is the first year when in the United States, CMS uh, finally approved the PCIs uh, on outpatient basis. Uh, why, why that happened? The, the road to that uh, was over 20 years. Uh, we have uh, about a million PCIs performed uh, yearly in the US, and cardiovascular uh, expense uh, is about 15% of the uh, uh, old expenses in healthcare. Typ typical hospital charges in Texas for a diagnostic uh, angiogram is 10,000, this is your DRG, and a PCI that varies, uh, and I never can figure out, you know, why sometimes it's 70,000, sometimes it's 40,000, etc. So we had to uh, try to at least uh, think about uh, reducing the, the cost. An outpatient uh, concept uh, was uh, from the early 90s. However, at that time, uh, uh, when Lerman did his first study, uh, he did this on angioplasty, uh, you know, uh, patients. And angioplasty, coronary angioplasty was completely uh, unpredictable. Uh, you, you never knew whether you dissect this vessel or not. It was sort of an art. Uh, so you can see the first uh, 63 patients uh, actually didn't have that much uh, bad outcome. But still, though, it's not far, far, far road to go. And then uh, in the 90s, there was a bunch of other studies. Uh, it was usually a, a kind of anecdotal experience, 50, 100 patients. Uh, but again, angioplasty was uh, 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 unpredictable. With the advent of stent, as you can know, the, the stent which actually worked was uh, a palmar shot stent. And that's uh, where, where I was working with both of them when I uh, came to San Antonio. Uh, and uh, um, so study is kind of more equalizer of the old operators, but not always, uh, m most of the time. 
And finally, in 2005, uh, Society of, uh, for, Cardio, uh, Cardio, uh, uh, for Coronary and Geography, I need to mention Sky, um, did a survey in uh, almost 300 uh, centers in the United States, and you can see that only uh, less than about 30 some, one third of the uh, uh, centers uh, actually, or, or physicians, uh, thought that uh, the PCI can be safe. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as you know, the funding is always more or less change. So uh, uh, there, there's the this, SCAF this PCI registry, and uh, uh, you know, in 2000, uh, you know, in 2004, 2008, uh, 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 among 100,000 patients' uh, interventions, only uh, 1,300 uh, were discharged the same day. So it's less, less than 2%. Then in 2007, the uh, CMS decided to stop paying for these uh, uh, you know, inpatient uh, PCIs. So uh, the hospitals uh, uh, were losing money and then we tried to figure out you know, what to do with it. So that, that's how the uh, outpatient uh, uh, concept was uh, more practical. And 2009, Sky uh, kind of arbitrarily uh, recommends uh, what can be done, uh, what, what's safe to discharge patients the same day. And as you can see, that uh, forget about the angioplasty, uh, chronic total occlusions, some multivessel, left main, uh, proximal AD, and stuff, they were all exclusion criteria. There, there was without any data, of course. Uh, well, we, we started, uh, this, we, we were kind of pioneering this stuff uh, since 2008, but the first uh, randomized trial actually was between the uh, friends from uh, uh, Dallas and uh, Mount Sinai in New York, and you can see that there was about what, roughly 150 patients in, uh, in each gr group, and uh, they randomized next day versus same day discharge the uh, no, no surprise here that patients who were discharged the same day were, were happier uh, and uh, have uh, less uh, uh, chest pain, uh, uh, even uh, less myocardial infarction, although these are very uh, uh, anecdotal data. Uh, so then there was uh, Cochrane in 2013, uh, meta-analysis, uh, 13 studies, uh, over 100,000 patients, uh, five randomized and eight observational studies. Compare same day in discharge with overnight stay, there was no difference. Uh, maze, uh, rehospitalization, et cetera. The one difference was, of course, cost. Uh, and, um, well, because of the complication rates were so negligible, you would have to uh, do a study on 17,000 patients. That was unpractical. So basically, this, uh, this, this uh, changes the consensus. And the sky. Um, change the uh, arbitrary discharge criteria, and uh, such things like CTO, multivessel, proximal AD, bifurcation, left main is no longer a contraindication. So, again, how to uh, reduce the discharge time? We talk about this: so the, uh, the radial axis, one-on-one uh, -on -one nursing, bivalent uh, uh, vascular closure devices, particularly on the patients when we do complex uh, uh, lower extremity interventions below the knee. And uh, these are our data. This is, this is time to mobilization in, uh, in our uh, center. Is, uh, as you can see then in the, in the interventional group, uh, it's about two hours and the uh, diagnostic group is, uh, is less. Time to, dis time, time to discharge is uh, it's a bit longer uh, because this is a mixture of the peripheral interventions when we go from the uh, SFA uh, and the radial. Radial uh, patients uh, were discharged uh, uh, in about uh, two, two and a half hours. Um, so th we have our own data. We have retrospective study which we published. Uh, patients uh, who came uh, to us for the coronary interventions, uh, we had no, no actually maze in 30 days. And then Maxi was uh, really uh, negligible. Uh, and since April of 2018, we have now prospective registry. So this is actually my volume in the, for the last uh, four years. I kind of slowed down, I used to do mo more cases, but basically this is our lab, that's, uh, that's what we do. Uh, last year we did uh, almost 1,000, a uh, year before a bit more. Uh, so let me just uh, show you the, uh, the actually, uh, the, the first unprotected left main done on outpatient basis. We presented this at TCT uh, uh, a year ago. 
So this is our typical San Antonio patients, 59 years old, uh, BMI is uh, 36, uh, she's end-stage renal disease, and she has uh, uh, class uh, uh, 3, 4 angina, and um, uh, obviously the, uh, you can see on the right panel this uh, severe uh, distal right coronary disease, and there is also osteo left main and the meta LAD disease on the left panel. So they calculated that syntax score was 21, uh, and uh, we uh, staged these patients, as you can see, we fixed the uh, first the, uh, 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 the the right coronary artery, and then uh, uh, a week later we did the uh, mid LAD and osteo left main. As a matter of fact, uh, the osteo left main is probably one of the easiest uh, things to do in experienced hands, uh, but uh, uh, you cannot make any mistakes there. And that's obviously uh, uh, this is uh, uh, at that time we used exclusively Zion stand for for some. Outcomes the reasons now we use our zero, which is, has uh, a self uh, absorbable polymer with, uh, with a different drug and uh, has better outcomes. Uh, obviously, if you do the left main, you better do the IBIS before and after, etc. Uh, so, you can even do this in uh, a very complex patients. Uh, obviously, they have to be selected and you have to have, have a good uh, uh, operators. So this is a, another example when you can see the left circumflex uh, proper about 90%. There is huge optus marginal, and that took you know two wires. And 15 minutes later, this is from radial access patient goes home. This patient actually, uh, as you can see, had bypass surgery. Uh, it didn't work very well. His uh, cervix completely uh, unprotected. This is a dominant cervix. You can see the very osteo disease there. I had to go to some old stands and uh, and uh, do it. And again. Uh, that's his right coronary artery before and after. And all this stuff, uh, uh, that's another right coronary artery. And, uh, and that brings us uh, to the peripheral interventions. As, you, as, you, as, as I was saying, that uh, San Antonio is the capital of amputations. But this is pretty complex. As you can see, the uh, right common iliac artery is subtotally occluded. Uh, you have two wires. And again, these are uh, two groin axes. Uh, this is also outpatient uh, uh, intervention and stenting, as you can see, and patient goes home. This patient has, uh, is a heavy smoker, as you can see, has a, uh, a aneurysm of the apopeteal and uh, SFA. Uh, this is a stent graft case, again, can be done safely. This patient has, uh, it's pretty typical stuff. Somebody put the stent, uh, uh, you know, uh, below the knee. Uh, that's not a good idea. But anyway, critical uh, popliteal disease, atherectomy before and after. And this is uh, uh, right, uh, uh, right SFA. You can see subtotally occluded. This is post atherectomy. Uh, that's uh, a left SFA again. That's typical uh, cases from the maybe last, even last week. This is a, a reconstruction of entire. Uh, uh, run of vessels uh, in the uh, uh, left lower extremity below the knee. You can see uh, there was only peroneal. Now you have uh, uh, anterior tibial and posterior tibial. Uh, it's all done. This is complete occlusion. Uh, this is actually a panteris, so you can see inside uh, where I did this case with uh, John Simpson. We we're one of the first cases ever done in the United States. You can see we were able to see and reconstitute the uh, uh, entire popliteal and uh, posterior tibial. Uh, and then this is an uh, example of uh, the subclavian uh, uh, steel. You can see uh, occlusion in the left subclavian before and after. These are pretty much uh, uh, typical stuff which we perform on a, on a daily basis. Uh, we have our research activity, obviously. We participate in various trials uh, uh, from interventional stuff to the uh, CERT, which was actually uh, 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 not uh, a very good trial. But dance, cobra, uh, and et cetera. With TAC. Now we have a, a, a trial to access uh, young yeah, chelation therapy trials and stuff. And then, uh, being practical, we, we uh, by aggressive treatment of our patients uh, and early treatment of peripheral arterial disease, we're able uh, to uh, decrease the uh, amputation in critical limb ischemia uh, patients from 20% uh, a year to 2% a year. That's an old study which we did, the uh, Save a Leg study in San Antonio. Uh, then, uh, obviously, this is our experience with bivalirudin and uh, very recent stuff which we published in CCI with uh, some editorial. 
uh, we, we were talking about uh, clinical significance of mirror lesions. Basically, uh, if you look at the profile 2 disease, fr frequently uh, same distribution. And if you have a critical ischemia on one limb, you better think about this, uh, that you don't change anything, the, the critical ischemia will come to, to the other limb as well. So uh, again, you should treat this aggressively uh, with plumbing and, and good medical therapy. Uh, so this is our, our publications for the last several years. And uh, that's us. Thank you very much. So uh, we're a little bit enthusiastic about uh, presenting some uh, one of the cases, the complicated cases uh, we did in uh, HIC. So we will uh, do a small presentation now.